absolutely. So yeah, 30 days time, I'll be running the entire London Underground above ground. Um, obviously at the time when I first mapped this, I didn't realize just how far the London Underground spreads. In total running distance, it'll be 572 kilometers. Welcome back to the Pill Performance Podcast, the show where we connect with athletes and experts in the field across running, cycling, or triathlon. Um, my name is Jared, and today I'll be your host. I'm stepping in for Damien. And today we're blessed to have not only the biggest runner on TikTok, but not only a Lululemon ambassador, but also ultra marathon runner, Johnny Davies. Johnny, thanks for coming on the show, mate. Appreciate it. More than welcome. Thank you so much for having me. Mate, love it. Um, mate, in true pillar fashion, what we always start with our podcast, we always go through the sleep scores of the previous night. So oh. open up your app. Yeah. yeah. Man, I'll, I'll, I don't mind. Yeah. How did you sleep last night, mate? Pretty good, actually. I woke up really, I, I had a random wake up, but I got seven hours. And out of that, I got an hour 50 deep sleep. So I'm pretty happy with that. Um, That's epic. Two hours of REM, three and a bit hours of light. So, uh, all in all, pretty damn good. I'm happy with that. Whenever I get above like an hour 40 of deep, it's kind of like my uh, golden lead. I know I've had a good sleep when I wake up and I'm very, very tired still. I'm like, oh, this is, it's hitting me there still. And within about an hour or so, I'm like, no, we're good to go today. Double session inbound. So, best way to start. Definitely, man. Honestly, man, deep sleep is like something so key and something we see with so many athletes. And I think, you know, for me personally, in my own experience, that one hour 30 is like, a really good sweet spot to hit like anything less than that and as you said you feel pretty groggy um so yeah definitely getting that deep sleep is what it's all about um for me personally last night i got a sleep score of 80. i actually only got six and a half hours of sleep last night but my deep sleep was at 135. um you know this morning did a quick track session it was early morning it was super dark so having to fit it in before work is always a challenge but knowing that you can get some good sleep beforehand is always you know a good confidence boost going into any session Oh, absolutely, man. Like it's, it's, it's such a game changer. And again, my, my knowledge of sleep was pretty, pretty, I thought it was pretty okay. And it wasn't again, like a, I wasn't too hard on the data. What I always never tried to do was get bogged down in the numbers or let it worry me too much. But it was when I started going through this specific training block because of the amount of volume I'm doing, I'm sort of logging 14 hours on the feet a week at the moment, plus all the gym sessions, plus all the physio and all that kind of stuff. I was aware that actually for me to be able to do this whole build, I needed to really focus on getting my routines nailed in, make sure I'm getting great sleep, not three nights a week, but seven nights a week, you know, making sure that's all in place. So incorporating the whole, you know, setting up my routine properly, just, just was the, the, I've, I keep saying to people, the biggest game changer for this build, for this run has been the processes, the, the sleep. That's, that for me has been everything. Because people keep asking me, how do you train, train twice a day? And you know, what do you do for recovery? I'm like, I sleep really well and I eat really good. Like, well, what else are you need for recovery? People want this magic sauce. It's like, it's good sleep health, really. And people say the magic sauce. So look, this pillar performance of magnesium has been a bit of a game changer for me. Um, that's why I'm more than happy to shout about it, just because it's uh, it certainly has helped and really just added that extra extra bow to my string when it comes to focusing on recovery. Because again, with the recovery market, I think there's so many. So many people sort of spinning a bit of a yarn when it comes to, you know, what they can do, what they can deliver, where it's coming from, all sorts of places, cordyceps, all these different things that really aren't backed in the data. And they're really very anecdotally sort of represented within their own marketing. Like, oh, this person had a better night's sleep as a result of this. Like, great. You know, give me a peer-reviewed meta-analysis study on the on the actual, um, on this. And they can't produce it. Whereas it was a friend of mine who's, um, uh, he's, he studied sleep and uh, neuro, neuroscience at university. And he was going on about magnesium alone at the same time you guys, we first started talking. And I was like, is it making that much of a difference? And he showed me his sleep, he was getting six hours of sleep, but two hours of deep. And I was like, oh, okay, he's on something here. Um, and yeah, so I was, I was hooked from that point. It's been an epic couple of months, just really honing in on my sleep and my recovery. Um, and it's just been, it's been the, the point of difference. You know, I've, I've done training blocks for ultra marathons before the marathons. And there's been so many times I've woken up feeling broken, feeling I'm not recovered properly, dragging myself through sessions that really made me resent what I was doing and resent the fact that I'm putting myself in the situation. Whereas not once throughout this whole process, you know, all these runs, week in, week out, building up mileage, have I gone like, I don't want to be here. Every set, every yeah. session is all for the purpose. And just that, having that great recovery has just helped so much with regards to, uh, 
my attitude towards training. You know, I know that even if my legs are stiff, I've had a good night's sleep. I can still get my miles done. I can. I don't have to moan about it. it just, it's, just, it's almost like a little confidence booster, like a little shield you can use being like, well, I still good sleep, so it's all good. Yeah, definitely. And like you were touching on different points and, you know, the confidence boost is the main thing. Like as much as the physical side of things when it comes to training and performance, like it's also the mental side, right? Like knowing that you've got a big session, the Ks are stacking up, the fatigue is sitting in your legs, but having that confidence boost in the back of your mind and having that kind of mental you know, ammo as to is a way to call it is just, yeah, that would give you a lot of confidence going to all your sessions, um, especially in the build up to, to your next thing, which is super exciting, which I'm sure we'll touch on a bit later. Um, you were talking just before about like your recovery teams. Like we know you use the triple magnesium, and that, but is there anything else that you kind of do like um, behaviors that you kind of have implemented that, you know, that, that have worked to kind of help with this process for this training block? Yeah, 100%. So this is actually, I got it from my buddy, Luke Hopkins. Shout out Luke Hopkins. If he's listening to this, I'm going to send it to him. Um, he got me on not drinking the fluids until like like up to 8 p.m. So I usually go to bed for around 10. So by 8, I don't drink any more water, nothing at all. Just because I found that like what kicks you out of deep sleep the most is the need to go to the bathroom. In the middle oh, of man, I've been there too. Last night, Last night I was guilty of because I woke up at like 6 this morning to go pee and I... I got back to sleep straight afterwards, but it's a case of like, I, I was just dehydrated last night. So monitoring my intake of fluids, stopping at eight, make sure, you know, that's not going to happen. And then, you know, the basic things, phone away at certain times, you know, no big lights on in the room, just like the lower, lower sort of bright, brightly lit lights. Um, dual part of the process. I usually have a nice shower before bed as well now, just to get me settled. Um, you know, my bed's comfy as anything. I always, I've, I've always been a big believer in. You know, you spend a third of your life in your bed. You got to make it as comfortable as possible for you, um, and make it the best place to be. So, no beds, good, good. It's just all about the nail in that nighttime routine, which I absolutely love. So, so, it starts a couple hours before. I make sure when I'm with food, you know, I'll only have complex carbs in my, in my last meal. I won't have anything that's going to be um, fast digesting carbs as well, because that can have a play and effect of glycogen levels, which can have an effect on your ability to sort of shut off as well. Um, so that's another huge one. Um, and yeah, I mean, I've always been a big believer that the, you know, people's morning routines are a, <laughs> a bit of a crock of shit really, because you, you know, you see these people, especially on social media being like, Oh, it's my morning wake up this time here and this time here. It's like a morning routine. It's, it's all about setting up for the day ahead. It's like, well, if you've had a terrible night's sleep and you went to bed really late, waking up at 5am to drink a green smoothie or, you know, you know, all this kind of stuff doesn't really mean much. It doesn't really do anything. If anything, you're just going to be doing it tired and think, well, I don't have this time. So um, I'm a big believer in a good night routine, you know, and that's why I've, the last couple of years I've started to adopt a better routine at night time, you know, and I think as you get older, you kind of have to make a point of doing it when you're really understanding your body, when you're really trying to push your body and get the most out of it, you really have to hone in on these things. Um, you know, you don't, I wouldn't definitely, anyone listening, I wouldn't say you have to, have a structured full routine, you know, tick to, almost like a checklist boss. It's second nature for me now. Same as brushing your teeth before you go to bed. You don't think about it, you just do it. Same for me as like, oh, this is my last meal, this is what I eat here. Phone's gonna go away at this time. You know, not look at screens, lights kind of dimming down. And just you're getting yourself ready to go to go to sleep. Um, and you know, and people say, oh, it may seem like a lot of hassle. It's like, well, you know what? When you wake up feeling fresh and you wake up feeling good and you wake up alert, ready to go, it's, it's you know, you're saving time in the morning anyway. I think, you know, if you can do something the night before, you know, my other things is, you know, setting out my clothes the day, next day, whatever I've got first thing, it's usually a run, just remove that friction, clothes are out, socks are out, I know what shoes I'm out, I've got my plan for what the run is today, uh, that's all written on my whiteboard, so but I, I, from when I wake up to when I can get out the door, pretty streamlined process, and any way of removing that friction, you know, we're there, um, but yeah, no, it's always the... Uh, I find it's the best way to, to deal with this sort of stuff is just get set up the night before and, you know, it saves you having to wake up an extra hour early to drink green smoothies and, uh, you know, lemon and the old tea is what, they, what these guys are doing. So That's so true. It works much better. Man, as you said, man, like the, a good day always starts the night before. It's always about the setup, all about removing that friction, man. Um, but, man, I, I would love to, like, turn the clock back. I would love to learn more about how you started, like, going through your, your Instagram, did a bit of a deep dive. We saw you had a bit of a rugby history. Um, man. Tell me a bit a bit more about that. I'm really curious, like how you transitioned from doing rugby to now doing ultra marathons. So, so mate, I, I never, ever, ever planned on being a runner in any aspect whatsoever. It was a really strange way I got into it. Um, rugby was always my sport growing up. What I played, um, 
you know, it was my identity was definitely sort of held in rugby. And I think you know, I moved, I traveled around the world a lot with, with work and lived in a lot of them places. So I was living in you know, Spain, Dubai, as well as England. And I played rugby in all those countries. And every time I went somewhere, I was always like, well, this is what I do. This is my identity is tied into rugby. And it's almost like a bit of a protection barrier. If anyone asked me what I did, and I was like, well, it was all my rugby player. You know, it was almost just like, it didn't give me the, the freedom or anything to, to, to justify who I was or explain who I was further than I play rugby. So when I got into, um, I think it was during, it was actually just before COVID. So it was a couple months before COVID was a thing. I was on a work trip out in Canada in Vancouver. And I, I you know, I, I had a couple books with me. I was, I was trying to really get on top of my physical health and all this. And I noticed that with rugby, you know, I was throughout a season, I'd actually, my physical health would deteriorate. Like I'd get like, I wouldn't look as good. My body was banged up by the end of a season. Yeah. I just thought, you know what? This is, I was thinking, hang on a minute, I'm playing a sport that actually what I really want to do is just get, get in as great physical conditions as I could. And I realized that, you know, the, a longer season went on for the, you know, the training around the sessions was just obviously my you know, three or four rugby sessions a week, plus the games and weekends and the gym stuff. I was like, there's not actually a lot of training going on here. The actual volume of training, the volume of stimulus isn't that high because you need to recover for the weekend. You need to be ready basically have a rest day before rest day after and the game that's three gone you've got four sessions left it's like hang on a minute if you're nursing some sort of injury you're banged up but you really can't put yourself into it and then on top of that you've got to eat way more than you need to to be ready recovered so it's not as if a case you can try and like elicit any sort of deficit throughout that period of time anyway over over the years you keep getting banged up and random really annoying injuries you know things like you know broken toes or nose or fingers or you know a fractured knee all Man, these things yeah. are adding up constantly and i was then out for like a couple months at a time and i was thinking what do i really like this enough to be spending a good proportion of my adult life not being able to do the things i wanted to because then i'll come back from injury i wouldn't be in the greatest shape you know it's, it's pretty you know the idea of going and doing any sort of cardio and actually you know we got to this work from canada and i brought me a pair of running shoes not that i ran i just like to wear running shoes around because i've got pretty big feet they're comfier um, and I'd wear them to sometimes in my training sessions with, with rugby. So I had them with me. I was like, you know what? I woke up at five and I was really jet lagged. I was also very hungover. I'm not sure where this idea came from. I went for a run at a place called Stanley Park, which is a beautiful park by the water, water side of Vancouver. It was middle of winter. It was about minus five and raining. So I just wore a pair of rugby shorts and a t-shirt. And um, it, was, it was one of the hardest physical things I think I'd ever done at that point. I just couldn't get my head around I was, but I wanted to push myself. I wanted to see this thing that I was always a bit cautious of. The thing I hated the most with rugby was the running aspect. Everything else was great. The running bit was a thing that I think it's because I wasn't very good at it. I was very apprehensive towards it. And I think that's the lesson for anything is generally we dislike the things we're not good at. Like there's a level of competency you have to overcome to find sort of enjoyment. I call it the skiing paradox. Like no one who's never skied before likes skiing because to enjoy skiing, you have to ski at a certain level to be able to get down the mountain. If you're falling in your ass in two seconds, you don't enjoy it. Same with running. Um, even though it's a very human thing we do, and you know, even coming from a sport background, you think, oh, you can run. It's like, but sport running and running, very different things. You know, it's sport running is you're going full tilt every time you're going for something. You know, there's no there's no understanding of pace control, all this kind of stuff. You are going at it every single time, which is not the most enjoyable way to enjoy uh, a twelve k run around this park in Canada. Um, anyway, went after this thing. It was you know, lungs burning, legs sore. I felt I was in absolute bits, you know, running performances all over the shop, but it was this very challenging thing that I wanted to really dominate. And I went out again the next day when I was there. So by the time I came back to the UK, I was thinking, you know what, let's just start incorporating a little bit of running in here and there. And then COVID hit. So I couldn't play rugby anyway. I couldn't really go to the gym much anyway. So I just started a couple of nights a week, just dropped, going for a, a trot, nothing fast. I was looking at videos and running online, learning different cardio zones, all this sort of stuff. And I was like, look, look, I think maybe the reason I don't like it is not good. Why don't we just not be good at it, but keep at it for a, a good period of time now? So I did that. And I just made sure that for a good 12 months, and the, this is the beauty of it. During COVID, there was no marathons on, no races on. I had no pressure to run any distance, any pace, nothing whatsoever. So I think a lot of people get caught up in running because they see people running marathons. They see all these amazing events. And I had zero interest in doing anything. I, no, I didn't, didn't care to for it because I didn't see it. You know, this running and I'd never, I'd been to the odd marathon here and there to see people run and it didn't really appeal that much to me at the time. And as I was getting better and better at running, I was like, you know, I don't have to. Just, you know, the purpose of this isn't, isn't to become a great runner or set a good time. The purpose of this is to enjoy the process of it. The goal isn't to get to the finish line. The goal is to enjoy the process of getting there. That's it. The, you know, the finish line of anything is when it ends. 
And I think someone put it down to me is, uh, you know, when two people are dancing, the goal isn't to get to the end of the dance. The goal is to enjoy the dance. In a piece of music, the goal isn't to get to the end of the music as fast as possible. The goal is to appreciate the music. So same with the process of running. The goal has never been for me to get to there quick as possible, and that's where the value is. That's maybe a part of it, and that's the structure to it, because some all things need to end. But at the same time, it's more a case of, you know, that process of getting you there. Are you doing it for the right reasons? Are you enjoying this process? Do you understand, you know, what it's doing for you and what it's doing for your soul as well as your body? And I managed to really hone that in. So for me, it was never a case of, and especially when you get into running, there's people who've come from, I mean, the running community is a really very welcoming place and most people get it, but you get the odd person who's just like, they're obsessed with your time. For them, is that everything's dependent on time. And I feel really bad for people who only run depend based on their, the outcome of their happiness is dependent on the time they get because I couldn't really care too much about the time I get on most of these runs. Obviously, I have personal goals I want to achieve, which are benchmarks on my you know, journey. But realistically, you know, I'm happy whether I, you know, run sub three marathon, sub four marathon, sub five marathon. I don't mind. It's, it's the process of doing so, you know. I'm never going to let that my happiness depend on an outcome like that, which ultimately, you know, so many, so many possibilities that can control it. And that's probably why I'm managing to keep going where I'm going and doing what I'm doing because, again, it's, it's understanding the pleasure of the journey, the people you meet on the way, and the effects it has for your body as well as your mind. So that's kind of where we got to. And throughout the whole COVID experience, just kept going. And then eventually, I think 18 months later, I was out in Dubai again, and a friend, there was no no events on a race on, and a friend of mine just suggested, hey, why don't you two, we're running with another friend, and a friend of other friends was like, why don't you two just like, run a marathon? We ran a half a week before just together. I'm like, you know what? Non-event marathon. Let's just enjoy it together. And we just logged it out and just did one. I was like, this is fantastic. It was, re- it was a real wonderful thing to go through. There's no crowds watching, no, no, no events of going on there. We just did our own thing and wait till our watchers hit distance. And it was it was an amazing thing to go through. Um, and it was only another year later that I actually did any sort of event. And, you know, it was nice to go to an event and see the whole process. You know, I didn't understand things like going to collect a beer. None of this stuff is all new to me. Even though I've been running for about two and a half years, it was so new to me because, again, I didn't know, you know I didn't understand where you got your bibs from, where you did this from. And, you know, even understanding what the world marathon majors were, I ultimately didn't care too much either as well because, for me, it's not about collecting, you know, these these things I've done, it was always always about the people you get to meet doing it and the experiences you get to have whilst doing it. And so because of that, you know, I really you know, I've always enjoyed the process of doing it. And that's why now, you know, the more I've done more ultra marathon events than I have formal marathon events now because for me it's not about gunning it to try and get there. It's just about you meet some amazing people doing it. It's a personal challenge. Um and then obviously now I've sort of transcended that into doing my own challenge runs whereby you know, there really isn't anyone else doing it with you. You're out there on your own. You know, there's no, there's not always a crowd cheering. There's no official start time. You get it done when you get it done. And I think you've got to have very strong reasons as to why you want to do those things. Um, I think, you know, especially when you're doing multi-day events, you really, there's a lot, a lot of times your mind's going to go to that place going, well, why are you here? Why are you really here? And you've got to ask those questions. You have to be confident in those questions. I've seen a lot of people do some pretty interesting running challenges and not really enjoy it and not really getting out because they, they put the outcome so dependent on a time or a goal or something that really doesn't matter. And actually that should never be the outcome of it. You know, the outcome for these challenges should be to inspire people to, you know, to encourage people to come join you to, to, to really get to the grip, get to the depths of you as a person and understand why you're doing this, why it's important to you. And again, if those reasons aren't strong enough, they do come out and it's a whole different experience and not a positive one. Um, so for me, that's why I've got them a challenge in, 30 we starting in 30 days so or the september the 7th and i'm so looking forward to it like i know it's gonna to be tough it's a part of the process of being tough but it's one of those things that i'm so grateful and happy to be able to do this and have a body that can work in this way and to have the time to train for these things you know i'm very aware that you know as much as these things are there are a sacrifice in them it's a sacrifice i've chosen to do and that comes as that comes a level of privilege as well to be able to do those things so I'm internally grateful for that as, you know, as much as I might be sore and tired and maybe not the best in moves every day, at no point will I ever be ungrateful for the opportunity to do this because it's not every day you get to do this, especially working with some of the some of the supporters we've got on the challenge, people coming together to help get make this thing happen. You know, there's a whole team of us putting this together. It's not just me joining along. You know, I've got coaches, I've got crew, we have got, you know, some companies, Lululemon, who are massively supporting the events. 
Um, and it's a privilege to work with so many great companies on this. Mate, that's so good. I think a big part of what I've been hearing is like finding your why and, um, you know, going into it with the right reasons and kind of, you know, having that kind of North Star is always like the goal, right? Like, as you said, like people go into challenges and they feel miserable afterwards because they're so focused on the outcome or rather than the process. I think there's a lot of value to be had when you look, when you're, you know, getting your value from the process, like trying to get yourself better every day, um, challenging yourself every day rather than focusing solely just on the outcome. I think with running, especially it's such a long-term sport, right? Like if you're trying to rush into things, you're just going to burn out or you're just not going to enjoy the process. Right. And I think like from what I've been hearing, you've been doing it for a while and, you know, building up to this yeah. big challenge is like, it's been a, a lot of stepping stones to get to where you are now. Um, so man, that's su- super awesome to hear. And like, obviously we're, we're very, we're keen to support you along the way. And, uh, man, maybe for a bit of context, man, maybe give, tell people about what's happening in, in about 30 days. Absolutely. So, yeah, 30 days' time, I'll be running the entire London Underground above ground. Um, obviously, at the time, when I first mapped this, I didn't realise just how far the London Underground spread. So, it's kind cool. Total running distance, yeah, in total running distance, it'll be 572 kilometres, um, and that's over the 11 days. And it's not sort of split evenly. It's split a different tube line a day, and they do vary in distance. So, there's quite a few, half of them are above sort of 75k, so pretty decent, you know, come out to double marathon distance each of those days. The other half of them vary between sort of 25 to 40K. And then we've got a one day, which is 3K, which is a, a nice little one we park two of the biggest days there. And um, so yeah, no, I'm really looking forward to it. It's going to be a really exciting experience to be able to go through. You know, there's challenges with things like this involving the fact that you're going from outside of a city into a city where it's busy, there's people, there's cars, there's tourists, there's, you know, London being the city that it is. It's incredibly busy. Air quality is not great in the sense of, you know, you've got things you're going to be stepping down curbs, not curbs, bikes. There's so many things that can actually affect this. You know, I, I was actually last week with a friend of mine who's run, currently, well, has just finished as of Sunday, running the entire length of the United Kingdom. He did it in 14 days. Incredible achievement. I was looking at the trains he was running on, and obviously he had to deal with cars going past him and maybe a slight different camber. But again, you know, he didn't have to deal with people stepping in his way, which I think when you're very tired, you're just in your own cadence, you're just in that step by step by step by step, and someone walks in front of you and you've got to step around them. It's like, oh, wait a minute, it, it's testing so different things. So we even have to build it into our training and, and, you know, get used to stepping around people, getting used to starting, stopping, understanding that, you know, there'll be times when you have to just be cautious of people around you. There'll be times when some idiot's going to walk into you and you fully it's putting me on the worst day when your legs are absolutely gone. So it's just, you know, understanding that there are going to be some unique challenges to this beyond the distance. Um, only good thing is London is pretty flat, which does me a big favor. That's a blessing. There's, there's not too many hills to overcome, which is which is really nice. You know, hills are definitely my uh, weak spot being, being the size that I am. So you know, I always find that uh, it's a slight challenge when we get to any elevation. Um, I know, I mean, again, this has been, we've been building this for a while. All the events I've done this year so far have been building towards this. I had a, a few different trail ultras. I did a trail ultra in America, an 80 k It was a full of vert. And that was, again, just a part of the process of building into this. So I did that before the start of this training block. And it was just a case of, again, you know, it's not every day you get to go run 80 k let alone in beautiful places like, um, upstate New York and with some wonderful people as well. So it was just amazing to, you know, again, get more time on the legs, just get used to it and remind yourself that actually when you're at that distance, things are okay. Like your legs aren't going to fall off. You're not going to, you know, drop dead of exhaustion. Like it's okay. I felt fine. Uh, towards the end, I remember that last 5K, I was just like, yeah, it's, it's okay. Like once you get used to this stuff, once you build enough reps in and get your mileage in and, you know, you don't jump into running an ultra within your first maybe year or two of running, you, you, you do get to that point. I mean, don't get me wrong, I, did, I always feel a bit alienated at the start lines of these events because most there's a typical sort of shape of ultra runner um, body shape when it comes to it. I'm definitely not that. I mean, I'm 6'4 and 100 odd kilos, so it's uh, I don't necessarily suit that build. But it also goes to show that, you know, you don't have to be any build to do these sort of things. If your reasons for, if your reasons for it are to, you know, enjoy the process of getting better at something or to own something that you may have once been not great at, then absolutely it's not, you know, it's not about conforming to a certain body standard or body type. You know, it, I'm still able to perform well in the gym, still got my strength there, but I'm also able to send it for, you know, 80K, 100K, 
570k, like I'm more than confident going into these things and my legs have been conditioned well to the point that, you know, there's not really too much of a challenge. Um, and something we look, we've actually looked at quite recently with my physio, um, great guy called Adrian from the running room, Australian. Um, he helps, uh, so yeah, oh, awesome. really good bloke. Um, I know he's doing a lot of work with Ned Brockman for his uh, run across Australia. Just, just an all round great dude. He'd give you a lot of good advice then. Yeah, he knows, he knows what he's doing. And I had a good chat with him last week when I was getting some treatment about like, I just said, why a lot of people I know in the ultra space or running space deal with a lot of different injuries. And over the last three and a half, coming to only four years now, I've never had an injury related to running, despite, you know, clocking up some pretty decent mileage here and doing a lot of events and pushing myself really hard. And the interesting thing he came back with was, um, was the fact that most people who come from a sporting background or a strength background, it, when they get into running, they may not be the fastest, but they're very resilient to injury because they've got that strength built in. You know, he was, we're in, this, we're in the studio with him, and there's a bunch of people in there with IT band syndrome. And I was like, I don't even know what that is because I've never had it. Like, it's one of those things that I've never felt those, those issues. And he's like, well, yeah, because they've got it because they lack the strength in those areas. Um, and, you know, that seems to not be a problem with yourself or anyone else coming from either a rugby background or a strength lifting background. You know, when you put that in there, it's almost a bit of a superpower, the fact that your legs are going to, you know, they'll still hurt, but they won't get injured. They're, they're, they're far less likely to get injured, even doing a lot of this stuff. Um, so don't get me wrong, there's, there's definitely a higher calorie demand on the body. You know, I'm chucking down a fair few carbs more than most people just due to the, the energy requirements of being a size running. Um, but, you know, coming from a coming from a standpoint of doing, you know, I thought when I first ran my, ran my first 100K, I thought the next day I'd be almost paralyzed. You know, I went to the gym and I was like, oh, and I, I did some arms, I was all right. It's not, you know, it's not, you, you'd be surprised how, how resilient your body can be especially when you set up in this way. So I think that actually, you know, I was put off running because I was worried about getting injured. And considering I went from a rugby background where I was getting injured every other week to now, you know, not dealing with any real injuries and clock in, we clocked 120K last week. And so I was thinking, That's and okay. I feel all right. Like I'm not, I don't feel like anything's going to fall off right now. And I feel really confident going into these last few weeks of the, uh, of the training for the Run the Tube project. So I'm really excited about it, and I think it's a, a wonderful thing to, to come for it. I think you know, I want to message to people, anyone trying to get into running, thinking, oh, well, I don't look like a runner, or maybe I'm not built like a runner. It's like, we're all runners. End of the day, we human beings are the most exceptional uh, long-distance running animal in the world. You know, maybe the fastest, but we have, you know, genetically you know, designed in a way or genetically developed in a way to suit us to be able to run incredible distances. You may not be the fastest individual in the world, that's okay. Like you are meant for running. It just takes a little while to get used to it and get into it. But once you get past that, you know, this concept of not feeling, oh, I'm not the right size or the right shape for it. It doesn't matter. You know, none of us are trying to get to the Olympics here. Well, some people might be able to, but I'm not. And I'm fine with that. I've accepted my fate here. You know, I'm, I'm much happier doing what I'm doing and, uh, and not worrying too much about that. Man, exactly. If you have a body, you can run, man. If you, you know, and that's amazing. Like, I think something that you just touched on there that's super important, especially for like recreational athletes is like how the importance of the gym and just getting in there and doing the basics. Like, especially when you're training for something like this, um, you know, it's something that's probably the most overlooked and the first thing that always gets dropped to as soon as the mileage comes up. And I've definitely been in that boat of like doing that as well. So yeah, definitely keep, keep getting your strength up. Oh dude, hundred percent. You know, it's one of those things I've worked with an unbelievable strength and conditioning coach here in London called uh, Harvey Lawson brilliant guy and he's he tailors it around when the mileage goes up he starts changing my training considerably like yesterday i had a leg session there was the volume was right down and the intensity was down there but it's still you got to go through the process of doing it even though i was tired i'd run a 12 that morning and i sort of get it done and even last last thursday i had a what was it a 25k run and i looked at the schedule and he's like no you, you've got a little bit of leg work to do this evening it's not much it's a little something we're going to incorporate some more core into there but you've got to go through the process of a couple of these things that I really want to nail on. Uh, and I'm so glad it does because, you know what, if, if, I was, if I was programming it myself, I'd have fully started my traditional leg day workout, which would have absolutely smoked me, and there's no chance I could have done that. So it's nice that, you know, having, having the right coach in place, you understand the demands of your body. You know, if you're reading off like a set training plan, often it doesn't incorporate into certain levels of fatigue, it doesn't, doesn't incorporate into... You know, understanding that actually maybe next week we would be ready for this. So it's nice to be able to work with a coach that gets this. And he's coached some incredible athletes. You know, um, he, he was, he's done Will Guja's strength and conditioning. And he's just completed his run across America. And I think it's like 54 days. So, 
you know, it's it's pretty. Yeah, I saw that. That was epic. That was that, crazy. I love that. And seeing and seeing you know people you know doing those challenges is really inspiring. And especially you know speaking to Harvey about how what he's got him to do. And again, he was all the way up to the the start line. He was he was getting his uh, S and C in. I think it's so important. I think we often get obsessed with the mileage in running. And it's very easy to do so. Definitely. And actually, people get so obsessed with oh, this is my weekly mileage, weekly mileage, weekly mileage. It's like, okay, well, what's your weekly strength looking like? How many how many sets of this? How's this looking? How's your range here? How's how's this going? Have you lost any strength in this area? So things like strength testing is a you know stays as a as a pretty big staple throughout the whole thing. Understanding uh, or during those deload weeks, deload from the weights too. You know, let your get your, let your central nervous system fully recover relief that body of most of the fatigue is built up over those few weeks and and just taking it um taking what it is you know understanding that yeah you know we're all we're all human in the day our bodies do need elements of uh you know time off sometimes and the odd deload week to really help out with what we're doing so that we can go into go into the next block with intent um around the training we're doing i think it's so so important rather than trying to you know average it together understand that there are building weeks there are weeks we're going to be doing more than others and then during those weeks okay what are you going to do about it how are you going to structure your life around it how's your sleep going to look we pull back to this and um, you know what's your nutrition going to look like for this you know what are you, are you going to increase the calories here how how's that all going to look and i think having a good structured plan around it is so important because i chat to people all the time who are getting into doing their first marathon doing the first ultra i had a message of a guy yesterday asked me about what his training should look like for a 100k race and his race is next month and i'm like Two things. One, I'm not the guy you asked me about that. I'm, I'm, I wouldn't be. Secondly, if you're asking how training's look for a 100k race this next month, dude, you, I, it's, don't, I, my recommendation in this case would be don't do it because putting your body through 100k without the proper training, without the proper conditioning is insane. Like, and you, you do get it all the time, you know, I'm, I'm, a lot of people are like, oh, but you got, went into the ultra world, you know, pretty near as like, not really. Like I ran for a long time on my own, you know, before posting anything on social media, I was running for a while, 2020, 2021, 2022 was when I started on TikTok. And even then I wasn't posting that much. And it's only been this year I've started really posting what I'm up to, going to events, posting about that kind of stuff. You know, I, I ran for two and a half years consistently, week in, week out, building miles, putting it through the legs, learning good form, good technique, good nutrition. All this process, all these processes were learned, built in before I was then going, right, now let's go to America. So what I didn't want to do is run an event and feel so bad about it that I didn't want to keep going because I see a lot of people, they'll train for a marathon, they'll run a marathon, then they'll stop running. So, okay, like, why is that? Oh, I didn't like the marathon. It was, it was really uncomfortable. It was horrible. It was horrific. The hardest thing I've ever done. It's like, okay, well, it's great to do a marathon. Don't get me wrong. I'm not shooting anyone to do marathons. Yet. It's great. It's a hell of an experience. The crowd carries you. It's a real wonderful thing. And I think it's a, it's such a great memory. And I think, I think everyone should run a marathon at one point, but definitely getting into running is more than a marathon. I think it's much more than a one-off race or one-off event, especially when, you know, if you run, if you want to get into running for sake of running a marathon, that's one thing. If you want to get into running because you want them, that's going to help clean your mind each day. You want them that's going to, is a, is a part of, becomes a part of your routine. And that, you know, you can bond with other people over, you can connect with other people over. It's a new, whole new world of people to meet and experiences to share. Then I think it's look, not looking at it from, from that perspective of, oh, let's just throw together a, a training plan. Let's just go all in on this for a few weeks, for a few months of training, and then not really enjoy it. Because I think it's one of those things that should be enjoyed. You know, the hard work is the training. The race day and the event is the fun. Celebration. Day. That's the thing you remember. Yeah. The thing that's like, you remember seeing your friends and family down there. Um, and again, this definitely isn't to discourage anyone doing doing it whatsoever. I think it's a great thing to do, but it's again getting down to the point of like you know, to understanding that your body needs time to build to these things. You know, marathon training doesn't start three months before you run a marathon. It should start six months before that to start building your base, to start getting on your feet, to start testing your distances, start feeling how different paces feel, understanding your heart rate zones. You know, really starting to build this in because it takes a long time to improve as a runner. Um, uh, you know, it's, it's not a quick process. You don't see instant return. You know, there's no way you don't see yourself getting better week in day in, day out or week in, week out. You only see yourself getting better looking at the bigger picture, looking at going through the seasons of the year. You know, you know most people feel like they're really bad runners in summer because it's hotter. As soon as September, October comes around, people are like, oh my God, I'm way fucked because you've been, you've been used to running in hot conditions. So it's really lovely to see, um, you know, when people really go into it and they start, you know, training, not for the sake of, oh, I've got this event coming up. It's, and often that's the, that's the way people get into it, don't get me wrong. But again, it's how do you make sure that, you know, you, you go through that process, 
it's hard, but you enjoy it. You get back, you would get a return from it. And then you get into the next stage, which is, okay, how can we keep building this as, as, a, as a habit? How can we keep maintaining this as a habit going on there? Because again, you see it, especially with social media, you see a lot of people get into running because, oh, everyone's running at the moment. And then they're like, this is actually whole, really unenjoyable. It's because, well, yeah, if you just do it for the sake of events, like it can become very unenjoyable because you're putting a lot of pressure and you're putting, again, you come back to that point of you're putting your outcome of happiness based upon a specific time that, again, takes a long time to go for. And I think, you know, that's one of the, the quickest ways to stop enjoying running is to put expectations on your outcome rather than trying to focus on enjoying the process. Because the process, if you let it become enjoyable, it's the most incredible things. And that's why I always preach, you know, doing it in a way that you enjoy running running slow. You can't run too slow. You know, you, you can't you can't blast yourself all the time. You know, you're going to cook yourself out. Um, you know, at the moment, I'm running most of my mileage like six-minute kilometer pace, which is pretty uh, even Big fan of that. Pretty slow, but actually, like, during ultra stuff, I'm running at 6.30 anyway, so it's not like it's a, a big deal. Um, and it's, it's nice. Man. I feel good. I feel I feel fresh on my legs. You know, it takes you know, the, all these thirty k runs take a long time to do, but I'm enjoying them anyway. So you know, it's not the end Man. of the world, and you know, never to be, never to feel like you're embarrassed by your pace. You should never be embarrassed by the pace you run at, at all. You know, that's that's one thing. And people, you know, you need to remember that no one's judging you for how fast or slow you run. If anything, people probably judge you running a bit too fast most of the time because people, everyone understand, everyone in running understands that. You know, you got to run slow majority of the time to build that aerobic capacity. You know, you've got to be running and sustaining that heart rate at a, a sensible rate, rather than trying to bolt out and you know keep up with keep up with people who've been doing this for a lot, lot longer. And it's hard to do. I've been guilty of it many times. You know, I see someone same and pace, and I'm one going. Oh, I want to kind of stick to that person, and then you check your watch and your heart rate shot right up. And you think, oh, shouldn't have done that. Man, it's something that I've learned along the way is like, you know, you should train with where you are compared to like where you want to be. Because like if you train where you are, you're getting the most benefits and you're getting the most adaptations to your body. Whereas if you're trying to train where you want to be, that's going to cook yourself. That's where you're kind of overreaching and overtraining. But man, I totally agree with what you're saying. I think we should definitely normalize running slow. Like, man, this is, like for me personally, that's where I saw like the most benefits and like, like especially like just... It was the biggest game changer, like straight up. You enjoy it more, you get better, you recover way faster. Um, and yeah, as you said, like you actually enjoy the process of doing it rather than just like, man, I've got to get to finish this run as soon as possible. Um, so there's definitely heaps of benefits to that. Um, but man, something that I'm just like, I'm learning from you just by chatting to you here is like, you're super relatable. Like, I don't know, for an, an everyday runner to someone that's training for something, you seem to be able to relate to the everyday person. And that's like, I love that. Um, and I think this is a good segue to take us to your TikTok. Cause like you said that in 2022 that you started like creating videos and now you started going harder in 2023. Um, something that I kind of have noticed is like the, the videos that do really well for you are the ones that are like the most relatable. Um, the ones that, you know, where you yeah. don't always see the, the most pretty, the most, I don't know, best runs or anything. It's the ones where you share, it's like, oh, I actually feel like crap. Um, is that something that you've definitely noticed yourself? Dude, 100%. Because what it is, is you're being honest with the audience. I think as well, there's this thing on social media. I think it's an overall trend on social media whereby a few years ago, people would put these like perfect looking lies. It's very, you know, um, what's the term? Um, like really well put together, um, like images or that sort of stuff there. But people kind of knew that wasn't real. People knew that, you know, Someone, you know, standing there with a cup of coffee looking like you know, a million bucks on a balcony somewhere, you know, look at this perfectly you know, curated sort of image. No one wakes up looking like that. No one, everyone knows this sort of stuff. You know, people being like, you know, my day routine, I got up and I did this and I went and I ran here and did this. And it's like, it all looks too polished. It all looks too good. Actually, no one's days like that. This shit happens every day to everyone. We all have to deal with, we, we all have to deal with a certain level of bullshit each day. And it's kind of like knowing that, hang on a minute, like, and then um, there's only two and chatting to friends about certain things because, like, a lot of the time I'm like, oh my God, you know, you just get all these miles down and get out running. It's like, yo, no, dude, I check. I'm like, I'd look at, I'll stand there, set on my shoes for 20 minutes for a run. And I'm thinking, same. <laughs> like, and because it, it, it's, it's understanding that actually that's a whole, that's a human experience resistance to these things. No matter who you are, there'll be something in your head going, nah, don't do it. Nah, don't go out today. Oh, it's raining. Oh, it's cold. Oh, it's this. Oh, you could do this instead. And, it's okay to think that. Cause a lot of people think they think they go, oh God, I can't do this because you know all these people are so amazing who I watch online and they can do this and they can do that. 
everyone has the same issues going on in their head. Everyone has the same things that happen like that, especially in the running space. doesn't matter who you are. And the more incredible runners I've met, and then they've said the same thing. It's like, okay, there's a big difference between what people put out in the content world of running and how they actually feel. And what that does do is it alienates people who are trying to get into running going, well, these people are doing this and this. And maybe it might inspire some of them people. But most people go, well, I have these negative feelings towards running and I have this negative feeling towards getting out and doing this because I'm tired because of this because of this and stressed. So I won't do it. My whole ethos is like, it's okay to feel these things. Like we all do. I still feel them. Like I might be clocking some, you know, serious distance in my legs each week. But guess what? Like 90% of the time, I'm like, oh God, I've got to do this still. And then it's the mental gymnastics you've got to take yourself through to get over that. And I think I was maybe even, when I first started posting, I was maybe just trying to maybe go the flow a little too much because I was like, oh, these are the ones I did. I didn't show the struggle. I didn't show the difficulty because I was like, oh, no one wants to see that. Turns out people do want to see that. That's actually what people really want to see. People want to understand. And and, and this is the thing. No one give, no one really cares much about how fast you are and your pace. That's what's out there. People want to know, how are you able to get out and do this? What is it you've done? What's like, how do you mentally deal with that? And this is one thing I've, I've understood. And that's why I've quite, you know, shift, had a bit of a shift in my content over the time, going away from like focusing on this event or this race or this, this. And actually more just like where I'm at with it because or like how I'm kind of processing it or dealing with it in real time. That's why I'm doing more reflective videos now that, first of all, I enjoy making so much better because I feel it's much more truer to who I am as a person. It's truer to, you know, the, the experience I'm feeling. Um, and I can speak much more directly to that. I can speak, I can be much more candid with, with what I'm feeling and expressing um, around, you know, how I'm feeling that day. Like even, what was it, the, uh, last week there was a, you know, I was, I was, I was cooked. I was so tired one of these days and I had a good sleep. But I was still really tired. And I was really sore. And it's a case of, you know, it took me a little while to get out the door that day. And I was just reflecting on that in the video. And it, it's, it's absolutely fine to, to feel that way. And, you know, consistency doesn't come from being great all the time. It just comes from not being great all the time, but still showing up anyway and understanding how you show up and understanding why you do that. And I think it's just, it's a lot better for people if you're transparent with them and you're honest with them and people respect that a lot more because when they realize going, oh yeah, like, okay, they, this person is human as well. And I think, especially now we're in this age where of content where people respect authenticity a lot more. I think, you know, I'm really grateful to be making content this period because I think it's a wonderful thing to be living authentic to yourself and putting content out that's very much you rather than feeling like, you know, you have to hide behind certain things or, and you can, people can see through this stuff now. People can see through people who are very fake on social media, who are just putting on like, you know, this version of themselves. You know, I'm not saying you have to share everything and go in your life by all means, but like the bit what you share has got to be you. It's got to be real because that's what people, you know, where there's a new generation coming through that really respect authenticity. They respect honesty. They don't want to see curated stuff. That's why TikTok does so well because Nothing's really that curated on TikTok. You pick up the phone, go, and it's actually your ability to storytell, your ability to, to engage with an audience based on what you're talking about rather than, you know, making things look good. And it's mad to see because I've seen so many people who, you know, a couple of years ago get amazing amounts of views on their stuff. And, like, they don't really get much anymore because they're kind of, like, posting this really super curated, you know, almost a bit like, look how great my life is. I'm over here a bit like... Life's good if you want to like work for it, but at the same time, like it's not always going to be great. And like you, you know, you, it's just understanding that you know things aren't always going to be going well, and that's okay. You don't have to make it look well. Like there's, I, I have good days and bad days, like everyone else does. And I think the beauty of social media these days is people can, you can, it's an okay to share that on there. It's okay to sort of under, get people to understand and buy into that because again, there's a lot of days, man. I'm not feeling up for it whatsoever, and it takes a long while to get up for it. And even sometimes I'll just have to shift the day around. Like, oh, maybe I won't run in the morning. I'll just say, hey, let's move this evening. Let's have a day. Let's eat some more. Let's sort myself out. Let's get, you know, really fix yourself up. It could be that maybe they just didn't, didn't eat enough yesterday and whatnot. But there's always something you can do. And understanding that if you don't feel up for it, it's completely okay. Absolutely fine. What it's about is how you choose to then deal with that process of, okay, I don't feel up for it. Why don't I feel up for it? Why do I feel tired? Okay, well, let's look at my week. Why have I put myself through this week? Oh, shit, hang on. I don't shouldn't feel like a failure because this week I've trained twice this day, once a day, twice this day, smash this, smash this, smash this. Maybe my body just needs to pull back a little bit. That's fine. I think, yeah, so true. And like looking, taking a step back and looking at the bigger picture is always good, you know, like, you know, especially if you're training for something, you can get really bogged down and really focus on that, you know, the next thing. But like, sometimes you just need to take a step back and be like, look, man, I've done some good training. 
my body's cooked. Maybe let's just take a step back. But um, yeah, what I've definitely been hearing is like, you know, people love relating to people um, and that's something that you're doing so well, man. So keep doing what you're doing and um, yeah, we'd love to see it. Um, I guess like a good point to go from here is like, it's going back to your challenge. Like I did a bit more research and I saw that you're going to be fundraising for a specific charity. I think it's Calm. Is that correct? Yeah, Calm, a campaign against living miserably. Man, what does that um, charity mean to you? Oh, everything, man. I mean, like, you know, I've had, I've had certain points in my life where, you know, I know, I'm, I know I seem a pretty positive person. It doesn't mean I'm always that positive. It just means I sort of have an ability to choose to be positive on, on most days. There's definitely periods in my life where I wasn't, you know, I lost that sort of spark about me and I wasn't feeling the way I was. I do now at all. You know, I was very, very different. I was much more self-critical, critical of people around me. I would just say, like, not, I'm not a nice person to be around, like, looking back on reflection. Like, the me now would not want to need to do that person. And I think it's really important to recognise that, you know, sometimes... You know, we all need a bit of help. We all need, you know, someone to talk to. And I think it's really important to, to, to recognize and understand that we're, we're, everyone's going through something, no matter who you are, what it is. Everyone's got their own life. Everyone's in their own little world. Everyone's got something going on. And it's okay to have something going on yourself. And I think that, you know, it's not, it's not a weakness to say, hey, you know what? I'm dealing with some things in a minute. And what I to talk about is actually a big strength. And for me, my issue was when I was going for a lot of different things, there's been some pretty... Pretty tough challenges I've had to face um, from, you know, going through teen years, early adult years, and I lack this ability to talk about them with other people, and I just sit on them myself, because I thought that's how you dealt with them. I just thought, oh, that's me dealing with it. I'm just going to sit on it and, and crack it on there. The problem is that these things come out in very unique ways. They come out in very obscure ways, ways you wouldn't even imagine, and that, that, can tra that translates to the char your character, that translates to your personality that translates to how you interact with the world and people around you. And, you know, if you've got any love for the people around you, you wouldn't necessarily do that because it doesn't, can often lead to you not being a nice person to be around. It can lead you to be, you know, pretty sure with people, very you know, lack, lacking empathy. And I think once you start taking a good look at yourself and actually not ignoring things that happen to you and actually being able to talk about certain things, what you can then do is move to a position where you create greater empathy and understanding for other people as well. And, you know, it's all a bit of self-love in there and it's, it all comes down to, you know, understanding that we all, as we all face certain things, you know, no one really teaches how to deal with a lot of things in life. There's a lot of, there's a lot of lessons in life that, you know, I don't recall any time in school in between maths and science that anyone says, hey, here's how you deal with when you, when you feel a bit down about life. Never got that lesson. So, you know, not being equipped with certain things as you, as you grow up. You have to kind of figure certain things out yourself, which is, is rather unfortunate because I really wish someone told me when I was younger, like, you know, when certain things happen, you, you, you should talk about them to people. Um, so for me, it was, uh, yeah, definitely a challenge. And I think as I got to a certain age that uh, I figured this out, I realized that by having those difficult conversations, they become easier, much, much easier. I mean, the first couple of times I was talking about these things, like, really difficult for me to talk about. As you talk about them more, they become a lot easier. And actually, anything you you understand them better as you're able to communicate them to other people, um, because they can sit in your head and you can feel like you understand them. But until you actually put it out there and really talk it through, you know, you really don't you, you really don't able to get it out there. So I think with charities like Calm, what they're doing is incredible. You know, the way that they offering support to people um, in so many different areas that are going through difficult times, especially in a period we're living in now, where you know. Suicide is the biggest leading cause of death in this country. I'm pretty sure it's pretty similar in Australia as well. And it's such a, yeah. it's such a strange time to be in where so many people are not able to communicate this thing. And this is why a lot of people, this is what annoys me a lot is people talking and saying, like, oh, you know, I want to talk about this mental health stuff here. It's like, yeah, because people are dying from it. Considerable amounts of people are dying from it. Until, that, that, until that's really sorted out and we actually understand why as a society, we've created a society whereby people, many people are choosing to take their own lives or in their own lives. That's a big issue with society. And that's not an individual problem. That's a societal problem, in my belief. And so that's why I think charities who do wonderful work like that, the Calm, Samaritans, there's a whole host of them in the UK that are doing some wonderful work. we got to ask these questions to why people are still feeling this way. Why are people still doing this? Why is it still such an issue? Um, and again, I think understanding and, yeah, and, and really getting to grips of going, you know, I think it's a lot of, it is a, it's a, it can be a, a loneliness issue. It can be a communication issue. And I think the more we, help and encourage communication between people, between friends, and when they're dealing with things or going through things. I mean, speaking to people I know who've lost people very close and through suicide, they didn't know the person was going through anything. It's not as if there was warning signs saying this, is because people feel that they can't talk about things through fear of judgment or whatnot. And, you know, that's why I think 
the running often plays a big part in this for me is because I, I can I talk a lot of the things I'm dealing with through whilst I'm running because I'm not distracted. Very easy in this day and age to get distracted. We pick up our phone, we can look at something else. To within a second, we're distracted and our minds onto something else. Whereas with certain sports like running where you're out there, you know, maybe you listen to music, but you're in your own head still. And you got you can't just quickly distract yourself and you can start working through certain things. And for me, running was a big catalyst into dealing with some of the heavier things of life for me and that I maybe hadn't have dealt with. And that for me is why most days I run. Very from physical health, but actually I don't really, it's not really for that too much either. It's much more for the case of, from a mental health perspective, running is great. And that's why I don't, I hate it when people try and get too in, bogged down into the pacing, you know, race times, that stuff. It's not a matter. But like, you know, we're dealing with a period where so many people are living miserable and unhappy lives because they're not able to deal with certain things going on in their life. They're not able to, they don't have the tools in place to deal with that. Whereas I always think, he would say such a cliche, oh, you know, clear your head, go for a run. Pretty good advice. And I wish I listened to that earlier. Like, I wish I didn't go, oh, that sounds so cliche. Like, oh. No, it's pretty good advice. Um, and, you know, it's, it's why I love spending so much time doing this because especially when I'm trying to focus my thoughts um, on the big things or even the little things, you know, it comes down to, you know, big things of life or talking, thinking about, oh, what video, how am I going to make this or, you know, little things like that. It's important, and I think it's really important to understand that. And again, you know, cardio obviously cardio being great for your physical health. My God, is it good for your mental health too? Most definitely. And like, you know, I guess touching back on that, like, there is a lot of strength to speak up and talk about these things. Like, you're definitely there's no point keeping it inside just because it's going to bottle up and it'll get worse. So, you know, for those that are listening, like, you know, just make sure it's 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 okay to speak up. It's okay to talk to people about these things, um, and. Yeah, like I think a big thing within, you know, all of endurance sports, it's a big community of people, you know, and I think finding that community and being able to, you know, connect with so many people, this all kind of ties into it all, you know, and I think that's like the beauty of like these sports, you know, like it's something that it gives you, not only gives you the time to kind of like reflect while you're doing the movement, but also like you can find people with similar interests and connect with them on so many levels and, you know, not only physically, you're not only your physical health will get better, but also your mental. It's like, you know, we encourage everyone to get out there and, you know, try and get out there and just move their bodies more really. 100%, 100%, you know, it's, it's, such, an incre- it's such an incredible thing, you know, and in that, I also find with people in the running community especially, are much more able to vocalize the things that they're going through or being through, and they're able to, they've, they seem more equipped to deal with it because they're spending a certain amount of time reflecting. Um, the same way that I, I struggle with I mean, meditation isn't a formal thing. Anything can be met a formal meditation. And I think I struggle with just sitting in a room quietly. I tried it before. I'm really bad at it. Um, same with yoga. I suck at it because it's almost a bit like I need more, you know, visual things happening. To it. Yeah. So I think with running, because you've got all that movement going past, it's why I can't run a treadmill. I'm, I'm too like, I find it really strange and at times not moving fast at all. I'm very conscious of where I am and the fact that nothing's like, you know, an optic perspective, nothing, there's no new stimulus coming through. I find that it's almost trance like when I'm in that run where I, you know, I very, even these days, I very rarely run with headphones in now because I'm just go, okay, I'm just with my thoughts for a bit. I respect that. Or at least I put the headphones in and then not play anything. It's still part of the process of going for a run. It's in Really? Yeah. So I think it's maybe yeah. a noise campaign. It just allows me to be in my own little world. Um, yeah, right. Cool. Cruise through. But yeah, it's, it's an incredible, incredible thing. I think, you know, it's uh, being able to just step out and do that and take that time each day to reflect on the thoughts, reflect on how you're feeling and really, really spend time understanding your emotion. You know, why do I feel this way today? Really, I'm always firm on that. Why am I feeling this today? If I'm, feel, if I'm feeling good, I won't really ask that question. But I'm like, cool. Like, I'm, I think, yeah, I'm, I'm feeling good. Let's keep going. <laughs> like, say, for example, say if like, I don't know, I'm a bit more agitated or maybe I've bitten at something or whatever it could be. Is, is it, you know, isn't to blame anyone else. It's always to go, right, Why? what's happening right now that's making me feel this way? Why do I feel a little bit uneasy about something? What is it? And let's really hone in on that. Okay, is that something within my control? The event, no. How I respond to it, yes. And you really just work for that way. By the time I get back to run, not two things. One, I've kind of tired myself out a little bit. My mind was more relaxed. I've got to the crux of why I'm feeling that way. And it's also a case of like, do you really want to now spend the rest of your day fo- like? putting effort and weight into feeling a certain way. Uh, do you really want to give whatever that thing has caused you to feel that way, you know, that much control over you and your emotions? And again, you know, this is why I talk about being positive as a choice. You've got to pick the positive, you know, choose, choose, choose to live that way. And it's easy to, don't really know, it's easy to live in a bit of like, 
you know, annoyance at something or someone, it's easy to do that. And I used to love doing that. I used to spend a lot of my time, you know, but it's such a, it's such a weight to carry around. You know, being pissed off about being angry about something is such a weight to carry around your neck. But actually, that's why I love that going for a go around. Like, so I get back, I've, I've stopped caring about it is probably the best way to do it. Is it something that's really, in, 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 put this way, in a week's time, will I care about it? Yes or no? Is it no? Then I'm just going to remove the weight and go, okay, well, I'm not, I'm not going to give it any consideration now. Time. It's done now, whatever it is. If someone's pissed you or someone's done something, ah, it is what it is. Cool. Next. And actually, it's such a powerful way to live, I think, when you can do that. And I find that when I'm not running that day, fortunately, I run most days now, but if I'm not running that day, I will often sit with that longer than I would if I was running. If someone's done something or, you know, we all like, we all get it. We all have to deal with difficult people on a day-to-day basis. Some people are just difficult. It's the nature of the world. Some people are ourselves. Fair enough. Um, you, you know, if I don't go for a run, they'll, they'll kind of sit with me a bit longer. And as I, I hate to say it, but like, it's one of those things that, you know, I like to think that I'm a pretty, I'm in control of, you know, my own, my own mind and my own thoughts. You know, I'm aware the process running gives me to help me deal with difficult people, difficult situations, because I then stop giving them energy because you've, you've kind of gone, I don't need to, I haven't got the energy to give realistically. What's more important to me today? What do I need to focus on today? Okay. Well, they're not going to take up any of my, you know, mental bandwidth whatsoever today. And it's a much better way of dealing with it. And so I think from a stress relief position as well, especially when most of the stress of life are external coming in, um, you know, you really think about what is it, what does it actually do? What does it actually mean? And do you really want to waste a precious day or a couple of hours of your day it is precious, time is limited and it's scarce on something or someone that really you shouldn't do. Yeah, life's too short to focus on things you can't control, right? A million percent. Mate, uh, Johnny, man, it's actually almost been an hour. That honestly flew oh, by, man. Uh, man, uh, thank you so much for taking the time. We're definitely going to put all your details in for the run, um, a link to donate as well. Um, okay. I was super pumped. Was super pumped to see to see you get out there, and um, yeah, I'll, I'm sure I'll see you out there as well in one of the awesome. days. So I'm looking forward to that. Um, but man, maybe on a, on a lighter note, mate, give us the rundown. Have you thought about like the first meal you're going to be having post all of this? Oh, um, a pint of Guinness, <laughs> mate. <laughs> oh, no, I'm I'm off drinking while I'm during this block, just uh, really focusing on everything. I know the effects of alcohol has on your sleep and recovery, um, and I'm very much like a balance for me is like a seasonal thing over the year rather than focusing on week by week. One hundred percent, I'm having a big old Guinness in a pub somewhere near the finish line, um, and then actual meal. Dude, because because I'm running so much, I can eat what I want anyway at the moment. You so eat what you want. I'm chucking down five thousand calories a day, and like I'm. I'm staying roughly where I'm at the weight wise. So from a, from a food perspective, I can eat kind of pretty much what I want. It's the beauty of ultra running. You know, you just got to get it in you. Um, but definitely, definitely a, a couple of Guinnesses, maybe, maybe a few more, but um, maybe a few more, mate. hundred percent. Yeah. I'm just, <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just looking forward to uh, yeah, a few good nights out with some friends as well. Because again, focusing with what I'm doing at the moment, like my friends are very understanding. They know how important this is to me. None of them are trying to like guilt trip me into coming on nights out or, drinking there's none of that sort of worrying about peer pressure it's actually if anything they're coming to join me on my long runs they're joining me on these things they're meeting me for lunches we're going for runs we're doing all this stuff and that's and that for me is a real supportive friendship group which i think is such an important aspect to this you know never they like oh god come on how they 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 know what i'm doing they know what it's about they know how important it is so that's really nice to see but in return for that i owe them a few good nights out maybe a trip somewhere afterwards because uh you know swings around about say Mate, definitely. Oh, I guess, like, last final note, like, from what I've been hearing is, like, you have such a good team around you, man. I think that's something that we can all learn from, you know, getting, um, you know, extra advice from a coach or having a good supportive friend group, you know, um, getting a coach in the gym. These are all things that people can action and things that, you know, can make a real difference in the training and life. So, man, Johnny, thank you so much for coming. Appreciate it.